Hello, everyone, and welcome to Eyes on 2022. My name is Eric Donenfeld. Today, we'll be talking about next generation refractive IOLs with two of my colleagues and very good friends who have a wealth of experience in this area. Again, I'm Eric Donenfeld from New York. Uh, I'd also like to welcome Julie Schallhorn. Julie, great to have you here. So great to be here talking about this, this really exciting topic. I'm out here in San Francisco at UCSF. Great. And then batting cleanup, Kerry Solomon, uh, one of the leading experts in refractive eyeballs. Kerry, say hi. Hi, guys. Uh, Eric, Julie, thrilled to be here from Charleston, South Carolina. Um, and uh, yeah, I've been involved with uh, refractive eyeballs uh, pretty much from day one. So I just want to start by commenting that we all consult with the major refractive IOL companies. So we all are consultants with these companies, specifically uh, Alcon, Johnson Johnson. Some of us are involved with, with Rainer, Bausch & Lohm, uh, BVI as well. So uh, we'll be talking about a lot of these IOLs today and we consult with them. We want to be very transparent about that as well. So with that in mind, uh, Julie, tell us, is there a need for refractive IOLs? You know, it's 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 a huge need. You know, presbyopia is you know becoming a really a crushing a crushing issue. We have a huge number of cataract surgeries that are being performed worldwide every year. Every single one of those patients that has cataract surgery is an obligate presbyope. So uh, this is something that is affecting people. It's affecting people as they age. It's affecting their quality of life, and it's it's really a, a critical need at this point. Yeah, there are 120 million Americans who are presbyopic. Uh, Dr. Solomon and I are two of those people. Julie, you don't quite qualify yet. I, you know, I know it's I know it's coming down the road for me though, and so I'm saying, let's get this technology going. <laughs> exactly, it's an exciting time with presbyopic IOLs. Uh, Kerry, uh, you just shared with us some information from MarketScope. Tell us about the growth of premium IOLs. Well, you know, when you talk about presbyopic correcting IOLs, when the first uh, IOLs came to market, the goal was really to determine that we can actually have a lens that can help someone read and see in the distance. And then over time, as technologies improve, we learned about quality of vision, we learned how to provide larger ranges of vision, and we learned how to decrease or minimize the trade-off between night vision symptoms and quality of distance and near vision. Um, but ultimately, the presbyopia correcting eyewell market has been fairly flat for many years. And we continue to say, but when technology continues to evolve, adoption will increase. And it's exciting, at least now in 2021, and that's the new latest market scope data that I've seen, for the first time in years, presbyopic correcting IOLs, the adoption is increasing. About 5% of lenses for presbyopic correcting uh, and presbyopic correcting torque, about 2.8. So it's around 7 to 8% is where we've been hovering. And we're now north of 10%. Um, and that's really exciting to see. And I think there's no question as technology is advancing and we have newer opportunities available, newer products for patients. I think the market is speaking loudly. Patients have an interest and it's nice to see some choices that are meeting patients' needs more and more. Yeah, I, I agree, Kerry. It's, uh, you know, cataract surgery for decades has been the defining moment of old age. You have cataracts, you, you're, you're officially old, and now patients view cataract surgery as a fountain of youth. This is the opportunity to restore their vision. Um, there are very few things in life that as you get older, you can actually restore to the way it was earlier in your life. And thanks to uh, these new pre premium presbyopic eye wells, a lot of patients are getting maybe not the, exactly the same vision that they had when they were younger, but they're getting certainly a good facsimile of this. Okay. Yeah, for sure. But, you know, people are living longer. They're leading more active lives. Technology has gotten better. People are having surgery at an early stage, not to say it's unnecessary, but we've just gotten better at what we're doing. So uh, so people are going to surgery earlier. And a lot of our folks have had LASIK. They're used to having distance vision. They're used to having at a younger age near vision. And people want to be less dependent on glasses. There are more people today over the age of 65 than there were in the history of the world um, going back a century ago. So the elderly population over 65 is growing at an extraordinary rate. And these patients are, are demanding and, and looking for visual correction. Eric, if that doesn't speak to the need for presbyopia correcting IOLs, I don't know if any other statistic can. <laughs> exactly. Kerry and I go back to the first generation presbyopic IOLs. And we all remember that in the early days, 
um, both Johnson and Johnson and Alcon uh, made the assumption that by maximally separating the images by creating four diopter add lenses, you would decrease the uh, ability of the patient to see the two different images and reduce the dysphotopsy that you saw with presbyopic lenses. So our first generation lenses were four diopter add lenses. And while they did give good reading, the patients were very commonly uh, dealing with significant dysphotopsia, halos, glare, um, all kinds of issues, and, and night driving became a real issue for them. So this is kind of my bumper sticker. If I if I wanted to put a, a refractive IOL bumper sticker on my car, this is what I would this is what I would write, and that is uh, when patients want a presbyopic solution, they expect to see up close, but they demand quality vision at distance. And what's growing the market today is that we're giving the patients the near still like we did in the past, but the quality of vision at distance has dramatically improved. And that's why presbyopic eye wells are getting better. Not that we're getting better reading, we're getting better distance. You know, Eric, to, to go back a little bit further, because I know you love history, the predecessors to the lenses, the four out lenses you mentioned was the old array lens. And yeah. remember the quality of reading with the array was not great. Um, it didn't have a premium designation either, but it was was not well utilized and patients complained they couldn't read. So the manufacturer said, we'll come up with a solution that will make sure you can read. And they did, but sacrificing distance vision for sure and a bunch of other dysphotopsies. So we've learned a lot over the years. You yeah. know, we, we really have, and, and all that makes sense, you know, not not being you know around and implanting those lenses at that time, that, that makes sense to me to say, hey, we want to give patients the ability to see at distance and we want to give patients the ability to read. And I think the thing that we have learned over time, looking looking at this history and just kind of like looking as 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 our technology has progressed, is um, you know when you have something in an optics lab, it's very different than implanting it in the human eye. And and our ability to understand what happens to these lenses in the human eye has really improved. And I think that's really what has driven our uh, our ability to to create these new technology lenses. A very good point, Julie. So the question then is, how can we resolve these issues of giving patients better distance vision while still maintaining their reading? So these are three separate FDA clinical trials that were performed, and they, the trial was with the Technus 4O, the Technus 3.25, and the 2.75. These are lenses that have been available for many years now. And what's interesting, when you look at the data here, the take-home message was the, kind of the last question that's asked in these FDA trials is, would you elect to have the same IOL placed again? And this is the Johnson Johnson lenses. And what you see with the 4.0, 87% of patients said that they would have the lens placed again. That's pretty good, but 13% of people saying no is, is probably not acceptable. When you go down to a 325 ad, it goes up to 94%. And then finally, with the 275 ad, it goes up to 97%. So the lower the ad, the more distance quality vision. And, and the better, at least with those lenses, the better night quality of vision too. Exactly. And it's not just Johnson Johnson, Kerry. How about the, uh, the Alcon lenses? It's the same story. Uh, you know, if we, if we move the near focal point further out, uh, like a three ad versus a four, uh, if you decrease the number of rings and you increase the quality of distance vision, patients certainly are happier. And I don't think... I mean, Julie is absolutely correct. A, a bench test, uh, an optical bench in a lab is not reflective of real world settings. We know that, um, but the data certainly speaks that. Yep, and, and everyone's visual system is not the same. Uh, small issues uh, in the cornea, the tear film, the retina certainly make a big difference in patients' quality of vision with these lenses. So recently there was a new designation uh, for lenses that, and, and, and a new group of lenses that have come to the forefront that are really driving the uh, acceptance of presbyopic eye wells. And these are the lenses that are termed as EDOF lenses. Julie, tell us about EDOF lenses. You know, EDOF lenses kind of straddle that nice um, a boundary between providing distance vision at what patients, as you say, demand and intermediate vision, which which is, you know, so helpful in our day, today's world, day -to -day world of, you know, iPhones and iPads and things like that. Um, these are defined as having a, a half diopter greater um, depth of focus than the monofocal control at uh, 0.2 logmar uh, with in, uh, superior distance corrected intermediate visual acuity and it, distance corrected intermediate acuity is uh, uh, two lines or better than a control in a half of eyes. 
and uh, the no change in distance correction. So these give improved intermediate vision, not as great near vision as our old high uh, multifocals, but they preserve that really high quality distance vision. Right. Oh, I, I always like to tell people these are like your iPhone friendly lenses. That's good. And uh, these lenses, by definition, if they meet the criteria of equal or greater than half a diopter, become uh, premium eye rolls. These are lenses that physicians can charge patients with a patient shared billing opportunity. If the patient has extended depth of focus technology, but it doesn't meet that criteria of a half adapter, then it becomes a lens that is um, an insurance accepted lens and the, and the doctor is not allowed to charge for these. So right now there are two lenses that meet the criteria of EDOF IOLs in the United States. And those are the original one, which was the Symphony, and now the new Vividity, which we'll talk about uh, in more detail. Julie, tell us about the Symphony lens. So the Symphony, the Symphony uh, operates on a kind of a modification of what um, the you know the diffractive lenses are. It is um, at its core a ring-based diffractive lens, so you get you know kind of the the two focal points, you know the the near and the intermediate focal point from that diffraction. But in between um, those rings, in the in between those steps, there's something uh, there's called an etchlet pattern on the edges of those rings, which elongates that focal point. So instead of having one distance, one intermediate focal point, you have a distance focal point that kind of blends into an intermediate focal point. So you get kind of all the acuities in between. And that that's nice because that mimics more what our natural, you know, our natural visual system does, which is not having a, a, a you know, one focal point, nothing or poor vision, and then a second po focal point, you know, our, na our natural accommodation has this continuous range of vision. And, and the symphony was a really, really, or is a really, really uh, great idea to, to mimic that with a, with a diffractive design. I think there's another benefit to this lens and EDOF lenses in general. And that is that they're more forgiving. So to reach your target refraction endpoint, an EDOF lens in general is a lot more forgiving if you leave them with a quarter or half a diopter of, of spherical error or even a little residual astigmatism. Patients can often have better uncorrected vision, which from a patient's perspective means you can be off the target refraction a little bit and they're still happy with a good quality of distance vision. And so it's a nice uh, little benefit uh, to be able to have that, that little extra room for error. Yeah, that's such a great point. That is really such a great point because we know that we can't get the target 100% of the time, you know, even with our best biometry, we're within half a diopter, 90% or so, so. Well, and the other thing is no matter what people tell you, <laughs> we've been around long enough to know somebody who wants intermediate and distance or a trifocal or near and distance, at a minimum, they want distance. So step number one, if someone's, you know, they're paying a premium price at a minimum, they expect good quality of distance vision and they expect to be happy with their distance vision in addition to what else we might be offering. This lens, this class of lens or category of lenses makes it easier for people to be happier with their distance vision with the limitations of where we're at with modern refractive surgery, which is still pretty good, but we often still leave a small residual refractive error. And, and the issue with this lens is it gives the best distance of any of the uh, presbyopic lenses, but the price you pay, you don't get as much reading. So you do get uh, very good distance with many of these lenses, but a lot of doctors are recommending a modified monovision. Uh, Kerry, you and you know, you, we, were, we did a, a study together, you were the first author on a study that looked at the symphony lens with a little bit of monovision. And that's one of the options that you have this lens with this lens. You can give them distance in one eye and the non-dominant eye give a little bit of mono vision. And that gives the distance and pretty good reading vision without the sacrifice you would have with a traditional mono vision where you lose the distance so significantly. Kerry, why don't you tell us about your, your impression of the study? Yeah, you know, well, if you think about it, um, folks who have had mono vision with their contact lenses or with previous refractive surgery like LASIK, when we do monovision, and typically people for full presbyo might typically use offset the eyes by about a diopter and, and a half or a diopter and three quarters, the distance vision in the reading eye is still reasonable. Yet when you try to simulate that with a true monofocal lens, that because artificial lenses in general don't have the same depth of field, I think, as, as our crystalline lens, the distance vision in their mono eye is often blurrier. And 
Well, most patients are great with monovision. It's I, I I have more patients that will still say, you know, my my eyes aren't working quite as well together as they used to with my contacts or with LASIK. When you do that with an EDOF lens, instead of offsetting this by a diopter and a half, you can offset them by diopter or diopter and a quarter. And because of that depth of field, they get very nice uh, vision. Uh, it's really not blended vision, more simulating the monovision that they had. And their eyes aren't so disparate, so their distance vision is quite intact. And so for folks okay. who've done monovision in the past, this is a wonderful option. But for folks who haven't done monovision, you can do what's called mini mono or blended vision where you offset them by a half or 0.75 diopters. And while it, the reading may not be quite as good as a full monovision, the range is still quite impressive. we will do very well with it. You know, I, I love that study that you guys you guys did, carry and and I, I think Steve Slade also did one too. And, and that after reading those, that that was that became my approach with these lenses, um, because you showed really nicely that you know even you know offsetting by like a half diopter, you don't sacrifice the distance vision, and you do get that improved near vision that patients really really enjoy without noticing you know the, any issues with the distance. Yeah, I, I want to just reiterate what Terry said, and that's something that I've learned the hard way, is that patients who've had monovision in the past uh, need to have an additional half adapter to three-quarters adapter of monovision with a monofocal eye wall to simulate the type of reading they had before. Terry mentioned that they, there's, there's more extended depth of focus with a crystal lens. There's also accommodation. People in their 60s and 70s have a quarter half adapter of accommodation, so you lose that. And when patients who had a diopter of... Uh, monovision with their contact lenses have the same amount of monovision placed in their monofocal IOLs, they generally are very unhappy. This lens simulates the monovision that they had before with their crystalline lenses. Let's go on to uh, the newest extended depth of focus lens, which is the Vividi. Uh, Kerry, you've had a lot of experience with this. Yeah, so this is the same class of lens, so all the same indications. Uh, yeah, the, the nice addition to the Vividi for this class of lens, um, unless you look closely, you don't see uh, what uh, the differences are between this lens and monofocal lens, but the focal length is stretched if you were expanded, uh, and it's through optics, not split light. And that's probably the one thing that distinguishes this EDOF uh, from uh, the previous one we discussed. The implications of that are that night vision symptoms, and that is one of the things with any light splitting lens, the night symptoms with this uh, EDOF, the Vividi, is very minimal. Uh, so this is really a lens that I think for a lot of patients who want to preserve their night vision, the benefits of having an EDOF, or for those physicians or surgeons that are just not comfortable with light splitting lens, this is a very forgiving lens. It's very forgiving on the on the uh, distance for your target refraction. It's very forgiving in terms of some small residual refractive error. The night vision is really very minimal, a very minimal halo, if anything at all. Uh, it does not provide full reading, similar to uh, the Symphony lens in the EDOF category, but it'll give you terrific intermediate. You can offset it by 0 0.5 to 0 0.75 to get a nice sort of depth, larger depth of field. And for previous monovision folks, you can offset it by a binocular. So you can use this similar way, the Symphony lens, um, but what this does provide is perhaps a little bit of quality of uh, night vision. If you look at the defocus curve, and that's what this shows, the defocus curve certainly demonstrates uh, that you have a little bit more depth of field out to almost a diopter and a half. But you can see compared to a monofocal that you have a larger depth of field, a larger or more broad range where patients are able to see 20, 30 or better um, with this lens out to about a diopter and a half. Yeah, so it's a great new addition to our armamentarium. It doesn't give you as much reading as the Symphony gives you, but it's also, as Kerry mentioned, a refractive eye well. It doesn't split light. You know, 100% of the light goes to distance and to near. And it definitely gives you that, that, that little extra nudge of, of, of reading. And for the first time with this class of lenses, I'm more comfortable placing this lens into eyes that I wouldn't consider putting a multifocal lens in previously. Uh, Julie, how do you feel about using 
uh, Vividi, or, and we'll talk about the eye hands in a few minutes, in eyes that have had, for example, previous refractive surgery or have mild glaucoma or have an epiretinal membrane, would you be comfortable putting a lens like that in one of these eyes? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I think I think the, the nice thing about the Vividi um, and, and about that, that refractive profile is that it is just much more tolerant of mild aberrations, either on the surface of the eye or, or mild issues inside of the eye. Um, you know, the, for, for me, you know, these are the patients that come in that, you know, I'm always, you know, that they have a little bit of dry, they've got some surface disease, you treat them, they look good. And I'm always worried what's going to happen when they, you know, go back to their old habits and their surface decompensates again with, you know, the, the trifocal IOL and they start getting, you know, aberrations. So those patients, I, I, I love this IOL for. I think it's great um, in our glaucoma patients, um, you know, again, like mild to moderate glaucoma patients, the little bit of ERM, you know, not the ERM that's like totally chronically up the macula, but, you know, something that, you know, may give them a little distortion, but, you know, you're still going to get good um, quality of vision in like the 2025 range. I, I think that this is great. And, you know, again, also for just, you know, if people do need retina work. It's my retina colleagues tell me it's easier to see through this than, than through a, a high ad multifocal. So, I knew this lens was going to be a hit when my very, some of my very conservative um, colleagues here at UCSF, you know, comprehensive cataract surgeons were like, you know, I put in some vividies. People really like it. I think I'm going to put in more. And I'm like, great. <laughs> yeah. You know, you know, well, for me, um, having done, been doing LASIK for, you know, 30 years now, this has become an annuity. Patients who came in the peak of LASIK in 1999 and 2000, we were doing 1.4 million LASIK a year in the United States. These patients are now coming back for cataract surgery, and they were so impressed by the value of LASIK and the ability to get rid of their glasses, and they want that back again. This is this is the type of lens I think is ideal for that group of patients who's had previous refractive surgery, where I probably wouldn't consider putting in a traditional multifocal. But for, for that group of patients, it's become my go-to choice going with the EDOF lenses. For a lot of conservative surgeons, they're embracing Vividi for sure, for all the reasons Julie mentioned. But for younger patients, larger pupils, more active, this lens is ideal. Most of these folks are on their computers most of the time. Ask them if they do a lot of book reading. They don't even know what a book is. Um, but uh, uh, I think for younger active patients, again, the Vividi lens has been terrific and well accepted. To me, for those folks that want to be least dependent on glass, you're going to want a trifocal or some of the newer lenses, panoptics, synergy, et cetera. But for those folks that are concerned about night vision symptoms, this is, uh, this is my softball all day long. Yep. And you can see here that a much greater percentage of patients were spectacle independent with this lens and they, and they get much better intermediate vision as well. And really no significant difference in visual disturbances between a monofocal and, and the, the and, and, lens. And that's the, that's the real key here. If you look at what's one of the Achilles heel, these days it's not so much quality of vision because I think most of the new presbyopic correcting lenses have pretty good quality of vision, but it's night vision. And so this, this particular lens, the night vision, it has a little bit of uh, some dysphotopsias, but very mild, very similar to monofocal lens. So let's bring us up to the, uh, the next lens. Now this is extended depth of focus technology, but it's not an extended depth of focus lens, but it doesn't meet the criteria of a half a diopter of reading, but it does meet the criteria of having the same distance quality of vision. If anything, I think the vision with this, with this lens is better than uh, the other lenses that we're talking about today. It's an aspheric technology, it's a refractive IOL. It gives about 0.4 diopters of, of reading. So a little bit less than the Vividi, um, visually indistinguishable from the, the Technus ZCBU lens. And um, the, the added asphericity gives a lot more reading. And I have been very happy about putting this lens in patients who have mild corneal irregularities, retinal problems, mild glaucoma. And uh, what's different about this lens is this is not a premium lens. This is a lens that you cannot charge for. It doesn't meet the criteria of a premium lens, but it does give a very nice addition in reading compared to uh, the previous ZCBU lens. And you can see that the focus curve looks very, very similar to the Vividi lens, uh, but it's just a little bit less. But on the other hand, 
This is a lens that patients can basically have for free in that it's considered a conventional lens uh, and not a presbyopic lens. On the other hand, I very commonly will use this lens and add a femtosecond laser or a manual limbal relaxing incision and charge the patient for the refractive solution of treating their, treating their astigmatism. And here you see uh, very similar to the Vividi lens, uh, uh, monocular distance vision, the same as with the uh, monofocal lens, and uh, no difference in contrast sensitivity compared to the monofocal lens, and dysphotopsia profile, very, very similar to the monofocal lens again, no real difference in halo, glare, etc. And the patient does get more reading uh, than they had with the conventional monofocal lens. So it's it's EDUF technology, but not an EDUF lens. Uh, and this is probably the best study that I've seen on, on this class of lenses. There's very little peer review literature on this, but this study was done by some really wonderful European surgeons who we all know very well, Gerd Offarth, uh, Burkhardt Dick, among others. And they found with the iHance lens that essentially uh, the vision was the same as a monofocal lens and there was no difference in dysphotopsia while the intermediate vision was dramatically better. So let's move past that lens now to uh, aspheric lenses. And aspheric lenses have really been the driving force behind quality of vision for many, many years. This was uh, invented by Pharmacia with the Technus family of lenses. And uh, it's really changed the way we, we look at quality of vision. And that brings us to a, a new lens which is the uh, iPure lens from BVI. This is again, not a premium IOL. Uh, Julie, do you have any experience with this lens? No, I, I unfortunately don't don't have any experience with this lens. I think it is it is just like the uh, just like the iHands. It is really really exciting technology, and, and I'll just go out there and say, you know, uh, it, my glaucoma colleagues who, especially in their more advanced cases, are are you know really paranoid about putting in um, you know lenses that will limit contrast sensitivity because that's such an important thing for advanced glaucoma. Absolutely love the eye hands and, and they're gonna love this lens too because they can give their their patients, you know, with the more moderate to more severe glaucoma, that increased depth of focus a little bit more spectacle independence um, and not worry about compromising their quality of vision. That is really, really exciting, I think. Uh, really exciting technologies for our patients. Yeah, the 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 eye hands and the the vividity have had exceptional acceptance. Both of these lenses are doing exceptionally well in the market and, and doctors are really gravitating push, but he, patients get good results. But this is a lens that you may not have heard of as much. It's the BVI lens and it's got a, a neutral spherical aberration. It doesn't give as much near as the eye hands or certainly not as much as the Vividi, but it gives very high contrast visual acuity and it maintains depth of focus. So you do get that little extra reading because of the aspheric profile. Um, another lens that um, is, I guess, very similar to the iHance lens is the Rayner lens, which is the EMV EDF lens, which is approved in the United States just recently. It doesn't come in a toric variety. And by the way, taking a step backwards, the iHance is available as a toric as well as the Vividi. And of course, both those lenses are premium lenses and can be billed for. But this is the Rayner lens. Uh, Kerry, can, do you have any thoughts about this lens? So I haven't used it. Um, it's an acrylic lens. It's a hydrophilic acrylic, uh, as opposed to hydrophobic, so slightly different uh, material. It's non-diffractive. Um, it is FDA approved as a monofocal lens, uh, but it does provide good depth of field. And you know, I know some of our European colleagues have had good success with it, and there's been some good studies. I think one of the studies is one of your former fellows, Eric. Yep, again, uh, very good uh, distance vision. And this is Alain Barsom out of London with his group there who have evaluated this lens. And this lens gives very good vision. I have not used in the United States, but we will be trying it out in the very near future. It was recently approved. Uh, again, it's a EDUF technology. And here you can see the intermediate visual acuity at two weeks uh, in patients who were in this trial with Dr. Barsom and his colleagues. Uh, they were able to hit the, their distance emetropic target very well. Uh, and with mini monovision, like uh, Kerry discussed earlier, they were able to get really good quality of vision at distance and get good intermediate vision and actually some near vision as well. So uh, this is another lens 
to add to that portfolio of extended depth of focus technology uh, that gives patients additional reading without sacrificing the distance in any significant way. So again, another exciting lens that's come to the market that we'll be able to evaluate in the very near future. Kind of the lens that changed everything for me in presbyopia was the panoptics lens. This lens was the first trifocal approved in the United States. Kerry, what are your thoughts about this lens? Yeah, I agree. This, this absolutely changed the marketplace. Uh, and the uh, market scope data reflects that, where this, is, this has become and is the predominant uh, implanted lens in the United States and is well accepted worldwide. Basically, what this lens is designed to do is to provide the most uh, spectacle freedom of, of what uh, is available, at least within Alcon's portfolio, to provide excellent distance, excellent intermediate and near vision, uh, a terrific range of vision, um, and a minimal uh, night vision portfolio. Uh, the, um, the night vision dysphotopsia is certainly no worse than a typical multifocal and possibly even a little bit better. 88% of patients had terrific vision for distance near and intermediate a vision in the FDA trial. And more importantly, um, the amount of patients to the question you brought up earlier, would you have this lens implanted again? I think it was like 99% of patients from the FDA trial said they would have this lens implanted again. It's very well accepted by patients still has the limitations of any light uh, splitting lens. Uh, this is sort of the money shot. This is the defocus curve. And if you look at the 2025 line, you'll notice pretty much across all um, ranges, this lens provides distance, intermediate, and near vision uh, with terrific uh, um, uh, resolution and, and, and great vision. You still have to, because it does split light, it, it needs to be, um, you, you have to, you have to hit the target refraction, patient selection for all the other things that we've become familiar with. But if you're looking to provide a lens that will give great spectacle independence, this by far is one that should be in your armamentarium. Yeah, I, I tell every patient that I talk to about trifocals, I say the patients who have trifocal lenses in my practice are by far my happiest patients, except for that one in 50 who's my most unhappy patient. And, and that's what you have to explain to patients, that there is that risk of glare and halo. And I always tell patients is that there's a small risk. We might have to explain the lens. I say one in 50, but it's probably like one in 200 that yep. that, that, that really occurs. But um, you know, we were part of the um, age. So we, we've been using this lens or following these patients for a long time. But it's interesting that when you talk to our OUS colleagues, most of them, well, I no longer use multifocals. We use only trifocals now. And clearly, trifocal technology has really revolutionized the OP correction, which has been nice to see. Yeah, I had expected that trifocals would have more glare and halo with them. And I was always a, a little bit suspect of my European colleagues. But the experience in the United States has really borne evidence that these lenses really do give good quality and they probably have less glare and halo than the bifocal lenses we used in the past. And here's Kerry's number of 99.2%. And that brings us to the Synergy IOL, which is the most recent uh, trifocal in the United States. Uh, and what this lens is, this lens is a lens that combines trifocal technology with extended depth of focus technology. Julie, have you had experience with this lens? You know, I, I have I have not actually been able to implant this lens yet. Unfortunately, it's stuck in committee at my right. institution, of course, because I'm at a university. Uh, but it is it is a really beautiful lens, and 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 I just I'm a I'm a big fan of the EDUF technology and the Symphony, and and I love how they brought it into the trifocal. And you know, you don't um, if you overlay the defocus curve of the Synergy and the panoptics, you get that beautiful range of, of vision that you get with the. Uh, here we go. Yeah, that beautiful, that beautiful range of vision, but you know, even more so because of that addition of that EDOF technology to the trifocal. And um, if you look at the, if you look at their patient reported outcomes, their their glare halos, you know, again, it's not a massive increase that you would expect, you know, with with going from like a multifocal to this. It it looks like if it as as with the panoptics, it's about the same or possibly even less than the uh, the previous like bifocal lenses. So I think this is. 
you know, along with the Panoptics, you know, wh whether you use the J&J &J platform, use an Alcorn platform, it is a really, really great addition to our, our portfolio. And I think it's, it's going to do great out there in the market. So I, I can't wait until our use committee approves it so I can start putting it in. <laughs> Yeah, I've I've had, I've had a lot of experience with this lens. It was part of the FDA trials, and we've we've put it, we've put in a, a lot of these lenses. And what this lens has, it has amazing technology, in that anytime you split light light, whether it be the panoptics or the synergy lens, you have to lose something, and the way you make it up is by applying very uh, interesting optics. And what the synergy does, it, it uses a violet blocking like the panoptics uses a blue blocking lens and that cuts out the more disruptive uh, shorter wavelengths. In addition to that, it has the most negative aspherosity and it has the best chromatic aberration. So it uses those three advanced technologies to improve the quality of vision. You still get glare and halo like you would with any trifocal, but it's mitigated by the improved optics of chromatic aberration and spherical aberration improvement, as well as uh, blocking the, the violet light. And it's been documented in studies now that this lens probably gives us a little bit more reading than the panoptics does. So when someone comes in and says, under no conditions, I absolutely never want to wear glasses. This lens gives about a half a doctor more reading according to the trials that have been done in, in, in Europe. And in my experience, it, it gives similar distance vision as, as the panoptics. So the distance is similar, similar type of types of dysphotopsia is certainly a great, great lens. So the panoptics and the synergy lens really give us two very good shots on goal at giving patients quality of vision at all ranges of vision. Eric, I, like you, I was part of the synergy uh, FTA trial and I had a very, uh, pretty broad experience with it as well. It's a great lens. To compare it to panoptics, I think there are a couple of distinguishing features. I think the night vision is probably similar, maybe slightly worse. And so we educate patients about that. I think the reading is probably a little bit better, certainly smaller print. And the synergy patients can read even in low light, uh, which is quite impressive. Uh, so, you know, they're both great lenses and they have terrific uh, acceptance. The injector for the synergy is fabulous. Uh, just balanced salt solution preloaded it's probably the best injector on the market. So it, it's a nice addition to what we have in the United States. And both the Panopsis and Synergy come as Torix as well. Both wonderful lenses, and they become my go-to lenses for patients who just don't want to wear glasses any longer. Totally agree. There's, there's a new lens that's going to be approved by the FDA any day now, and I'm extraordinarily excited about this. Julie, as a corneal specialist, this is like the dream lens for us. We've been waiting for this for a long time, and that's the... Uh, IC8 from AccuFocus. Um, this is a lens, which is a small aperture. It's, it's a pinhole. It's 1.2 millimeters. Julie, tell us about this lens and why it's important. I, I am, I'm really, really excited about this lens because, you know, there's a lot of people out there that have, you know, corneas that cannot, don't have the optics to get, uh, you know, a trifocal or even, even a, an EDOF like the Vividi. You know, these are patients with keratoconus. These are patients that are post-penetrating keratoplasty. You know, they're patients, they've had issues with their eyes before, but they still want good vision. They still want to be able to see, and they want that, you know, if they can get it, this the extended depth of focus lens. And this is such a great lens for that cohort of patients, because with the pinhole effect, you'll, you'll get two things. You'll get increased depth of focus with the pinhole, but you'll also get mitigation of corneal aberrations as well, as you will with any pinhole. So it's going to be you know, it's not going to get rid of all corneal aberrations, but it's going to be, you know, really like killing two birds with one stone. So for my, for my patients with, uh, you know, in my practice with the, the sicker eyes, the eyes that have, you know, have had more happen to them, I think this is going to be a really, really great technology for them. Yeah, I agree. This is a lens that I'm going to use almost, almost in every patient who has had radial keratotomy. That's the, you know, you mentioned keratoconus, post-graft, some LASIK patients, particularly hyperopic LASIK, LASIK where they have uh, some dysphotopsy and glare and halo. And it's going to give patients much better distance vision as well as giving them reading. And in the, in the FDA trials, this is considered an EDOF lens and it gives about one diopter of reading. So it gives actually more, more reading than the eye hands, uh, more reading than the vividity. Uh, and it does that by extended depth of focus, similar to the F-stop on a camera. And uh, this is a lens that I think we're all really excited about it. This is a lens that's in Europe. It's not available in the United States and it's probably gonna not ever get to the United States. I'll just show this for completeness. And this is the 
extra focus from Morsha, which is a uh, add-on lens. You put this on top of your IOL and this goes right into the sulcus. Uh, but again, probably not gonna get to the United States in the, in the very near future. So visual function equals visual quality plus vision quantity. I just wanna spend one minute going through the future and that is the accommodating lens. Accommodating lenses work the same way that the natural lens work. There are a variety of different lenses that are in the market right now. And Kerry and I have both gone down to Mexico and implanted this lens. And that's the holy grail is not to split light, to have a lens that can give us distance and reading without the star bursting glare or halo. Kerry, tell us a little bit about your experience in Mexico and what you saw with uh, this with this IOL? Well, it's interesting. It, it goes in, it has both the base and then an optic portion. You implant them separately and then you assemble it in the eye. It sounds uh, fairly technical, but in practical use, it was very achievable. I think both you and I found that uh, the learning curve was quite short and very easy to assemble this inside the capsular bag. They look beautiful. Uh, in the eye uh, post-operatively, and it's quite remarkable. We had a chance to see some patients who had been implanted and had been six months to a year post-op and uh, really reading quite well, depth of field terrific. And obviously the, the holy grail aspect of this is it doesn't split light, it doesn't stretch light. So the quality of vision at all distances should be great. You said it earlier, but it needs to be said, Eric, there's no free lunch, right? So whether you stretch light or split light or whatever, Anytime you try to do something to take away from distance vision in any regard, there's a compromise. Uh, in theory, an accommodative lens would have no compromise. So uh, we've had a great conversation today. Julie, take us home. You know, I think that the, the take home point is really that there is just so much exciting technology currently out there on the market and coming to the market. I am constantly amazed by the way people are able to innovate to solve these these problems that we're facing and and how you know just how much stride we've made in the last 15 years in terms of quality of vision as as well as you know range of vision our pre-existing conditions you know that previously were not candidates for multifocal the bifocal IOLs the trifocal IOLs a lot more IOLs are on the market and are coming soon to the market that can help out those patients and you know the the current IOLs that we have, the EDOF IOLs as well as the trifocals, really have been engineered to give you know the best quality vision that we can with the the current technology. And um, I think that we're seeing that in the market scope data, just with increased adoption. And you know my own personal N of one experience with my you know really conservative colleagues being really excited about this new generation of lenses. So I think the future is bright for uh, presbyopia correcting IOLs. Yeah, and, and I just close by saying that. Uh, for those of us who maybe were not interested in presbyopia correction or considered the risk of putting a trifocal or a multifocal lens in, these new EDF lenses allow all cataract surgeons to become refractive surgeons because they're so safe, um, they're so extraordinarily successful, and there's very little risk with these new lenses. So if you're not doing presbyopic technology, now might be the time to get started. In 2010 or 2012, when these first came to light, and you told someone you could give someone an EDOF lens that wouldn't have cut mustard because everyone's reading printed material and newspapers and printed books and magazines. Today in 2021 and beyond, we have computers, we've got email, we've got iPhones, we have high contrast, well-lit vision. Our needs are more intermediate based. Uh, and so it's a perfect opportunity uh, for surgeons who may have been hesitant in the past. Today's technology really meets the, the needs of today's patients. So on behalf of Julie Shalhorn, Kerry Solomon, and myself, thanks for joining us for Eyes on 2022. Well, that was a great lecture. And uh, I really appreciate two of my really good friends in ophthalmology, two of the best ophthalmologists I know being here with us today. We have Julie Shalhorn and Kerry Solomon. Julie's uh, gonna become chairman, I think one day at the University of San Francisco. Uh, we're working on that right now and, and, and carries in practice in uh, uh, South Carolina and just a legendary ophthalmologist. So you heard all about those different uh, lenses. And I, I just want to also say this is the largest um, virtual education meeting I've ever been at. I think 10,000 people registered. I think there are 5,000 people on today. What lenses are you really excited about going 
into the near future, Julie? You know, I, I am just so excited about the accommodating IOLs. I, I think that giving a, you know, a lens that has the ability to store true accommodative potential kind of in the way our eyes work when we're young is going to be a game changer. You know, right now I tell patients, you know, we can give you near vision, we can give you far vision. It's going to be different than what you had when you were 20 that works on different optical, optical principles. Once we get a true accommodating IOL, that conversation is going to go away. And I think people will come to expect the type of vision that you have before you become presbyopic. So when those lenses get approved, and by the way, the LensGen lens just got its uh, acceptance of the FDA trial. So that's that's coming down the pike very soon. Kerry, you've actually been to Mexico. You put these lenses in. What do you think about these lenses? Well, you know, they're interesting. You, they, they get inserted via two parts, a base and then an optic. I like the concept of it. it it's not that difficult to assemble in the eye. Um, but uh, the concept that it could provide really high quality vision at all distances, I agree with Julie's very very exciting and the, the optic is interchangeable and exchangeable so it, it opens up the doors for lots of options and opportunities when these lenses get approved will the trifocal lenses that we're using now go away or become less used so yeah you know i i think the market will tell if it's giving a full range of vision then the answer is yes i think no doubt but that doesn't mean people need to wait until these accommodative lenses uh, come to fruition, because that could be some time away. And the truth is the market's speaking loudly now for the first time ever, the adoption rate of premium IOLs and presbyopic correcting IOLs is increasing. And I think it speaks to the fact that we've got newer technologies and better technologies that are very well accepted today. And so I think, you know, if someone is looking for an alternative to their glasses, i.e. refractive lens exchange, or they have a cataract and they're looking at their options, we've got great options today. But certainly down the road, an accommodative lens is something we're all looking forward to. So Julie, a, a lot of our listeners probably have tried the old uh, bifocal lenses and maybe some of the new trifocals, and they've had patients who had some glare, dysphotopsia, and they've just said they've abandoned it. What would you tell these, uh, these doctors about some of the new EDOF lenses and how they can be implemented into their practices? You know, the new EDOF lenses are really, really exciting because they work on, you know, and specifically the Vividi, um, but also some of the, you know, the, the IHANTS um, as well, work on a different optical principle than our diffractive, you know, bifocal and diffractive trifocal lenses. And with that, you, you know, you, it's a, a little bit of a trade-off because maybe the near vision isn't quite as good, but you eliminate that um, the, those, those halos and glare symptoms that the, the, the diffractive nature um, induces. So for patients that are really worried about, um, you know, photic phenomena, for patients that are really, really protective of their night driving ability, and maybe you're okay, you know, with, you know, putting on, you know, a pair of reading glasses to sit down and read a novel or, or you know, do something up close. Those are a really, really great option. And, and for me personally, you know, I also love how they're a little bit more tolerant of, um, you know, dry eye, corneal aberrations, you know, I, I with my, my, my practice is a tertiary care cornea practice. And, you know, you know, most patients come in with something, something funky going on. So, uh, you know, they have really, really offered um, a, a platform for these patients that want to have more near vision, but just haven't been able to get it in the past. And I think that's going to open up even more with the, uh, the introduction of the, um, the, the IC8. I'm, I'm very, very excited about that. Oh, the IC8 lens, that's a, that's a good topic, a whole other topic. Carrie, what's changed in your practice in the last year and, and um, what's exciting to you? Well, our adoption rate technologies has always been high, but it's continuing to increase. So I think that's certainly been um, a nice change. And I would go back to one comment you made earlier about uh, either patients or uh, eye, pro eye care providers who maybe have a certain slant against a multifocal contact lens or patient that's failed. I kind of disregard that when I'm looking for a selection for an IOL with patients for a couple of reasons. First, I think that the intraocular lenses work better than the contacts. Um, and so it's really about, as Julie said, um, patient selection. If someone's scared about photic phenomena and then an EDOF, someone really wants to be less dependent on glasses in general, then it's a trifocal. Um, and the truth is that if they don't tolerate it, the lenses these days are very interchangeable or exchangeable. And so I, the fact that someone 
may not have successfully worn a multifocal contact lens in the past, in no way deters me from offering that to them as an option. Good point. And with these new DF lenses, these patients who uh, have had previous LASIK, they have a yeah. lovely retinal membrane, uh, are, are either of you comfortable putting these lenses in where I probably would not have put a trifocal in? Are you using the EDF lenses in these cases? Julie, what do you think? I, I, I definitely am. I, I think that the EDF lenses give us a lot more flexibility in eyes that maybe don't have the perfect optics that, you know, what you really need for a diffractive, a diffractive lens. So, you know, my retina colleagues like it, they can see through it during surgery. Um, I, I, you know, I feel much more comfortable in putting it in, you know, somebody's post LASIK, somebody's maybe got a little bit of a, you know, not a ton of irregularity, but it's just a little bit. Um, I, 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 it's been a practice expander for me, really. And the other option, of course, is a light adjustable lens, which has a little bit of EDOF built into it with negative spherical aberration. And I tend to aim for a little hyperopic endpoint initially and then treat that, which creates a little bit more negative spherical aberration. And it really covers two things. It allows me to more appropriately dial in the target end refraction, and they get some degree of extended at the field as well. So it's always another good option in that subset for sure. Terrific. Well, I really want to thank my friends, my colleagues, uh, Kerry Solomon, Julie Shallowhorn for spending some time with us today. Um, this has been a great show. This is the third day for Eyes on 2022. Um, I hope you're all enjoying it. I hope you come back for some of the later sessions we have going on uh, today. Uh, make sure you have a glass of Jessup wine tonight after you've been educated and you feel comfortable. Kerry, tell us a little bit about, about Jessup wine. Oh, I, I love Jessup wine. I love the blend, the art of the blend. Um, but, you know, I'm probably a little biased with my uh, opinions there, Dr. Donald. Yeah, so there's nothing like a great glass of wine at the end of the day to, to yeah. relax. Yeah, Kerry Solomon, myself, uh, Vance Thompson, our fearless leader, have all been involved with Jessup and uh, we, we really enjoy it. And they're sponsoring the meeting here today. So, everybody, go relax, go to the exhibit hall. Check it out. There's a lot of things to see. Register for the prize that you have there. And uh, thank you all. I'll see you back for the next session. Take care, everyone. Thanks.